Good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing today? Good. Good. Good morning. Good morning, Professor. Um, before we start, I have a question on homework three. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so um, lately I just been at home and then because um, I've been sick and I have a family member that is sick, so I couldn't really go out and then from from my room and stuff, I can't really see cloud. Even when I go out to the garden, I can't really see clouds to take a picture of. So is it okay if I use picture from before that I took? Oh yeah, if you have a prior picture, that's totally fine. Okay, all right, yeah. thank you. And there's still time to do it as well. If you, <clears throat> uh, There still is time, but yeah, no, if you have some prior pictures that you've taken, that's totally fine. I hope that makes sense, hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. Just making sure. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let's jump in. Um, I hope everybody's doing well this morning. I'm glad to see you all. Um, those of you who have your webcams on, thank you so much. Um, and let's jump in to today's warm up question. So, oh, crud. I. Well, I'm actually about to change that just as um, you're all working on the, sorry about that, just as you're all working on um, today's participation question, I'll get those up really quickly. So today's participation question is, why do you think meteorologists actually look at the upper atmosphere? Like why, why do we launch weather balloons? It's not just because, it's not just for fun, Though it is kind of fun to do. Um, and yet, while you're all doing that, let me really quickly rectify that problem. Let's fix that. And then oh, let's put that up. I will paste the link again. All right, I just uploaded today's slides. Awesome.
Oops, sorry. Let me get that out of the way real quick. All right, let's take another minute. And for those who have just trickled in, let me paste the link again. All right, take one more minute. Mm -hmm. All right, it looks like almost everybody has turned this in. I'm getting a pretty steady stream of responses now. So let's take a look and see what people have had to say. Let me switch over to the question and share my screen. <clears throat> so what are some reasons we launch weather balloons? Um, I think meteorologists would want to study the atmosphere because it tracks weather patterns. That's very true. We'll actually start talking about that in about a week and a half. Um, I'm guessing they would want to study the atmosphere because the data they collect helps them predict our weather forecasts. Because meteorologists want a greater understanding of Earth's atmosphere for all of humanity. Um, studying the atmosphere could help determine current future weather conditions and its effects on Earth. Let's see here. Not totally sure my guess is because it's e it makes it easier to predict weather. That's actually very true. Um, so let's see here. Trying to find new things, so it's a way of exploring the upper atmosphere. Used to acquire information from the uh, upper atmosphere, such as wind speed, wind direction, air pressure, humidity, and temperature. Mm -hmm. The upper atmosphere shows the bigger picture of weather formation. Um, a reason could be to track patterns. Um, it's used to predict weather. Let's see what a few other people here are saying. Um, Possibly to discover if the upper atmosphere has some effects on weather or climate as well. <sighs> um, relatively unknown area. To see the correlation between the upper atmosphere and weather at the surface level. Mm -hmm. Oh, here we go. Studying the upper atmosphere gives us a feel for how much hot air rises. We launch balloons to see how helium functions being in a different atmosphere. Um, to measure the levels of the atmosphere, finding the chemical measures, um, weather in the upper atmosphere and how it affects people on Earth's surface, predicting natural disasters. Um, these all look pretty good. Um, let's see here. Study effects it has on humans. 
helps us monitor the ozone layer. Um, the upper atmosphere could help explain why certain things are happening near the surface of the Earth. Um, let's see here if there's any. The upper atmosphere has influence over the weather in the lower atmosphere. That's essentially what we're going to be talking about today. Um, they love weather. Mm -hmm. Two people just said that they don't know. Well, let's, let's demystify that. So, what we talked about last time was how air behaves as it rises. And pretty much all of last time, all of the last lecture, all of our last time together, I pretty much just kept telling you, well, let's assume that air can just rise. Let's just let it rise, let it rise, let it rise. We'll figure out what lets it rise later. Well, the time has come. That's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about how air is able to rise. Now, before we do that, um, let me just talk about this picture for a super brief second. Um, that is a 25 year old me from 10 years ago. Um, my first semester at San Jose State as a grad student. The gentleman next to me, his name is Jeff Forgeron. He is actually now a meteorologist for a TV station up in Portland. And he was on a reality TV show. Um, and we were preparing to launch a weather balloon. So this is actually the first time I ever got to launch a weather balloon. It was really cool, really fun. Um, just a cool picture to show. But anyway, what we are gonna be talking about today is what allows air to rise. And more specifically, how that relates to something called stability. And when you hear the word stability, it kind of almost has an ominous sound to it. Um, because when you think about stability, it's also very natural to think about instability, something that is unstable. And the stability of the atmosphere makes a big difference between a nice sunny day and a tornado outbreak. So that's what we're talking about today. Now, before we do that, a super quick review from last time. So last time, I talked about this process called adiabatic cooling. Who can remind me, what does adiabatic mean? From last time, what does adiabatic mean? What does adiabatic mean? Okay, one person says no cycle. Close, but not quite. Two things exchanging heat. Heat isn't transferred. Yes. So when we talk about adiabatic, what we're talking about is this concept that as air rises, it does not exchange heat with its surroundings. There's no heat exchange between a parcel of air, a big bubble of air, and its surroundings. And so that's what we talk about. That's what we're talking about when we talk about this idea of adiabatic cooling. Now, the good news is because something cools adiabatically, there's a lot of factors that we can take out of the picture. We don't have to worry about advection. We don't have to worry about radiation. We don't have to worry about conduction between one air bubble and another air bubble. We don't have to worry about any of that. The only two things that we have to worry about are the expansion and contraction of the parcel and any condensation that happens inside of the parcel. The good news for this is that it actually allows us to come up with two set rates of cooling. The first rate of cooling for an unsaturated parcel is what we call the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So this is called the dry adiabatic lapse rate. It is the rate of cooling for an unsaturated parcel. In this case, as a parcel of air rises, 
for every thousand meters it goes up, it cools by 10 degrees. So if I had an unsaturated parcel here at the surface of the earth, and let's say it had a temperature of 17 degrees Celsius, I pushed it up a thousand meters, it would now have a temperature of seven degrees Celsius. Why? Because it went up a thousand meters, so I subtract 10. And that process would just keep going. Another thousand meters, you'd subtract another 10. Another thousand meters, you'd subtract another 10. On the other hand, when a parcel is saturated, it actually cools at a rate of six degrees for every 1,000 meters. So instead of cooling at a rate of 10, it cools at a rate of six. The reason why it cools at a slower rate is because condensation is happening inside of the parcel. As condensation happens, this magical process called latent heat release occurs. And latent heat is then released from the parcel and into the surrounding atmosphere. And that actually slows the rate of cooling down. It slows it down from a rate of 10 per every thousand meters to six per every thousand meters. Now, who can remind me though, how do we know if a parcel is saturated or not? What do we look at? Brianna, yes. We have to compare the temperature of the parcel to the parcel's dew point. When a temperature is greater than the dew point, that means that air is unsaturated. However, if a parcel's temperature equals its dew point, the parcel has become saturated. That's when we would switch from this 10 to this 6. So that's just a 30,000 foot flyover of what we talked about last time. Now let's apply it to the concept of atmospheric stability, because that's really what matters here. Um, that and the whole fact that we get about half as much rain as Santa Cruz because of this process. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the stability of, it, of the atmosphere. Basically, can temperature be significantly lower than the dew point? Nope. That's a process called supersaturation. That's actually a little bit beyond the scope of this class. What will happen in that case, when the temperature becomes lower than the dew point, any excess moisture will condense, and that will cause the dew point to drop down to the temperature. So once the parcel and the dew point are equal to each other, once their temperatures are equal, they stay that way. For, for, the, purpose of, for the purpose of this class, there actually, is, there actually are supersaturation processes that happen. We're not going to talk about that right now, though. Um, great, great question. So what we are going to talk about are the differences between a stable and an unstable atmosphere how much moisture in the atmosphere affects stability. And then we're gonna talk about at least one way that stability affects our lives, even here in the Bay Area when we don't get tornadoes. So let's dive in. So let's start with a little bit of a rhetorical question. Well, not a rhetorical question, but a little bit of a, uh, of a thought experiment. Let's say you are walking on top of a hill. You're walking on top of that hill, and there's a ball on the top of the hill. You look at that ball, it looks like my head, so you decide to kick it. You look at it, and you go, that head looks like Terrence, I'm going to kick it. Grr, that darn Terrence, boring me to death. If you kick that ball, what is it going to do? Bingo. Yes. I see somebody making the hand motion as well. Yeah, it's going to roll down the hill. If you kick that ball, it's going to roll down the hill. Is it going to return to its original place? 
that point at the top of the hill, is it going to return there? No, of course not. No, it's not going to do that. Instead, it's just going to roll down the hill. Okay, now on the other hand, let's suppose we have a ball and it's here in the middle of a valley. Now let's say you're walking through that valley, you see the ball, upset over your last homework score, mad at Terrence, you decide to kick it. What is the ball gonna do in this case? Mm -hmm. It's gonna go up, then back down. In this case, the ball is going to roll up the hill a little bit because of the momentum and, and the kinetic energy that you've given to it by kicking it. But it's ultimately going to roll right back down and resume its original position. It's going to go back to the way things were. Right? In this case, You kick the ball out of its position, you take it out of its position, rolls up the side of the hill, and then comes right back down. It eventually returns to its original position. In the first case, the ball on top of the hill, when you removed it from its original position, it never returned. However, here, when you kick the ball, when the ball is in the valley and you kick it, it rolls up the side and then rolls right back down. It returns to its original position. <clears throat> now, both of these situations are examples of what is called equilibrium. When something is at equilibrium, it is at rest. It, it, it has reached its balance. It has reached its magical point. It is now at rest. So when, when you kick a ball, rolls up the side of a hill, rolls back down, or whatever, you, what you are actually doing is you are disturbing the ball. You are removing it from its original position. You are removing it from its equilibrium. Now the setup of the ball greatly, de uh, that greatly determines what happens next. When the ball is on top of the hill and you remove it from equilibrium, you disturb it, <clears throat> it doesn't come back. It just rolls down further and further and further down into, it just keeps going. It just keeps going and going and going until it reaches a new equilibrium. In this case, that equilibrium that it was originally at is what is called unstable. It is what is called unstable equilibrium. The reason why is because all you had to do was nudge the ball. And boom, it goes down, 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 down. And it just keeps going. On the other hand, for the ball in the valley, it was in its original equilibrium. You kicked it but it eventually returned to its original equilibrium. That is a stable equilibrium. In that case, you remove it from its original position and it just returns right back to it. Goes right back to it, life is all good again. Goes right back to it and we resume life. <clears throat> so, what I've just done is I've just illustrated the idea of stability. In both cases, the ball was in equilibrium. When the ball at the top of the hill was at rest or at the bottom of the valley at rest, in either case, it was at equilibrium. In either case, it was at equilibrium. However, when you disturb that equilibrium, in the first case, 
it just moves further and further away. That is the unstable case. In the second case, it goes up and then goes right back down. It returns to its original position. So that first case is unstable equilibrium. That second case is stable equilibrium. So how does this relate to the atmosphere? Well, think of a parcel of air as like a ball at rest. Depending on the stability of the atmosphere, if we take that, that, that parcel of air and we throw it up into the atmosphere, it's going to do one of two things. If it's like the ball on the hill, it's going to just keep going further and further away from the ground. In this case, the parcel is just going to keep going up, 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 and up. On the other hand, if the atmosphere is stable, the parcel will behave more like the ball in the hill. I push it up and it sinks right back down. That is what determines the difference between a stable atmosphere and an unstable atmosphere. In a stable atmosphere, air sinks. In an unstable atmosphere, air rises. So this is just two drawings basically demonstrating the difference between stable and unstable. Um, in, once again, in the stable situation, the big rock that you're pushing just goes right back to where it started. In the unstable position, the big rock moves farther away from where it started. So in the atmosphere, stability determines whether air rises or sinks. Now, in the past, I've told you before, warm air rises, cool air sinks. When air is warm, it rises. That's why when you have a fire burning, you can see smoke rising from the fire. It's because that smoke is made up of trillions and trillions of parcels that are warm and they rise. On the other hand, cold air sinks. But what actually determines if air is warm or cold? When I say air is warm, what does that actually mean? For me, 60 degrees is warm. <laughs> For some people, that's cold. So we can't just use subjective terms. We actually have to have an accurate comparison. And why should we even care other than wanting to get an A in this class? Well, the reason why we should care is because the stability of the atmosphere plays a huge role in weather conditions. For example, if the air is really, really stable, any smoke that tries to rise can't. If the air is really stable, smoke that tries to rise will stay trapped near the surface of the earth. Remember those past, you know, the past few weeks when we've had all of those really bad air quality days where it's just been really smoky, really, really, really bad air. In some cases, it even became hazardous. Well, on those particular days, the atmosphere was really, really stable. And what that meant was any air that tried to rise was actually being contained, was actually being trapped near the surface of the earth. This is kind of what you see on a stable day. You see a lot of haze, you see a lot of, um, so you see a lot of haze, a lot of smoke. Um, if you've ever wondered why some days we have spare the air days, even when we don't necessarily have a fire nearby, it's because on those days, the air is very, very stable. And so it's kind of, it kind of just stays down here near the surface of the earth. It, and all of the pollutants that are in it stay down here near the surface of the earth. On the other hand, in an unstable atmosphere, air is able to freely, freely rise. 
And as that air rises, as per my corny dance, it expands, it cools, and it condenses, and we get really, really tall clouds. Um, can anybody tell me what kind of a cloud is this? What kind of a cloud is this? A white cloud. Okay, it's a white cloud. It's a fluffy cloud. Brianna and Chase are both very close. Cumulus. It's a type of cumulus cloud. It is a type of cumulus cloud. Cumulonimbus. This is a cumulonimbus cloud. This cloud actually spans from near the surface of the earth to upwards of 30,000 feet. These are very, very, very tall clouds and there's a lot of water in them. Does anybody know what cumulonimbus clouds are oftentimes associated with? What you oftentimes get when you get a cumulonimbus cloud? Storms, yes, storms. So in an unstable atmosphere, this is the kind of stuff that happens. You get very stormy weather. You get lots of giant cumulonimbus clouds because in those cases, the air is allowed to keep rising and keep rising and keep rising until it eventually hits the tropopause until it eventually reaches the top of the troposphere. Then as all of this air is rising, it then has to fan out. But until then, it just keeps rising and rising and rising. So let's see here, how do we do the homework if, if smoke is obscuring any clouds? Um, so, there are some days where definitely it's been pretty smoky outside. There are also some days where it hasn't been super smoky. Now, one thing I will say is that if the weather conditions continue to be very smoky and, and not really good for clouds, I will extend the assignment. Um, somebody asked me actually at the beginning of class if they could use some pictures that they've taken previously. That is also perfectly fine with me. Um, so that is a good question. So if you do have any problems finding clouds, um, or if you have any problems with smoke obscuring clouds, um, that's, I totally understand. Can all five types be in the same picture? Absolutely. If you, if you, find, uh, if you find five different types of clouds in one picture, that is totally fine with me. Um, good questions. So yeah, I mean, really the purpose of that assignment is just to get you looking and just to get you kind of thinking about the different types of clouds there are. Um, can multiple photos have the same cloud type? As long as it's not the exact same cloud, you're fine. And what I mean by the exact same cloud is you can't see like one cumulus cloud, take five pictures of that same exact cloud and turn those in. But if you have pictures of like five different cumulus clouds, so maybe one you took this morning and then another one you saw later in the day. That's totally fine with me too. <laughs> hopefully that helps. That, hopefully that helps demystify that a little bit. Still plenty of time to get that in. Um, so in an unstable atmosphere, in an unstable atmosphere, you see clouds just like this. You see really, really tall, really, really stormy clouds. So that being said, how do we actually figure out stability in the atmosphere? How do we actually know if the atmosphere is stable or not? Well, here's how. Here's how. <laughs> What would you get? Would you get wet when you dive into a cloud? <laughs> uh, we'll actually talk more about um, precipitation next time. But yeah, there's a lot of droplets in there. It'd feel very misty, but yeah. It's kind of like if you ever walked out in fog before. 
All right. So here's how you determine if the atmosphere is stable or not. You have to first remember that we are talking about a parcel of air that is completely isolated from its surroundings. That means it doesn't exchange any heat with its surroundings. The reason why that's important to know is that our parcel of air is going to be cooling its own way, either due to expansion and contraction or due to latent heat release. That's it. Those are the only two ways that a cloud, or sorry, oh gosh, now my head's stuck in the clouds, literally. Um, that's the only two ways that the temperature of a parcel of air changes. But that is not true for the atmosphere outside of the parcel. The atmosphere outside of the parcel is doing its own thing. It is totally doing its own thing. And what that means is that other things are at play. Things such as radiation, advection, um, conduction from other parcels, other types of sensible heat releases. There's all kinds of other things that can greatly determine the temperature of the atmosphere. So when you have your parcel, I'll draw a big parcel here. Here is our parcel. And then everything outside of the parcel is, ah, is atmosphere. So you have the parcel and then everything surrounding it is the atmosphere. All right, that being said, because the parcel is cooling adiabatically, whereas the atmosphere is doing its own thing, the temperature of the parcel and the temperature of the surrounding atmosphere are oftentimes different from each other. And that is what determines if a parcel can rise or sink. It is the difference in temperature between the parcel and the atmosphere. So once again, it is the difference in temperature between the parcel and the atmosphere. The difference in temperature between the parcel and the atmosphere. Now the good news is those lapse rates that I showed you for the parcel, those we can keep using for the parcel. But for the atmosphere, because it has its own way of cooling, it's doing its own thing, we can't just calculate, we can't just easily model the temperature of the atmosphere. We have to do something with it instead. In fact, really, the only way that we can measure the temperature of the ambient atmosphere is by launching weather balloons. That is why I asked that question today. Because figuring out what the temperature of the atmosphere is tells us if a parcel of air is going to be able to rise or not. So here are a few different meteorologists. These, these meteorologists actually work for the Fire Weather Research Lab, or at least they used to back in the good old days. Um, this lady here, her name is Angela. She now works for the National Weather Service over in uh, Caribou, Maine. Um, but they're out there on the field launching weather balloons, partially because we want to know about how stable the atmosphere is because it is the stability of the atmosphere that determines the difference between a really smoggy, smoky, ugly day versus a day where we're getting thunderstorms and tornadoes and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. Now, I should mention really quickly, there's other factors that go into that as well. Um, you need more than just an unstable atmosphere, but an unstable atmosphere is a key component of getting really bad storms. So we launch our weather balloon. It floats up into the atmosphere. As it's floating up, 
it is constantly measuring temperature, dew point, air pressure, wind speed, wind direction, and all these kind of stuff, all these kind of things. And it plots the data on a diagram like this diagram right over here. This is what is called a sounding. Um, basically what it is, is it is a plot of air temperature versus height. Now I know what you're saying. You're kind of looking at that going, oh, I don't want to deal with those. Don't worry. These soundings are oftentimes skewed so that the whole graph will fit on one page. I would never give you anything this complicated. Here's what I will give you though. What are all the Fs on the right? Oh, so these over here are what are called station models. Basically what these are, yep, wind speeds, exactly. So if you notice how each one of these has a different number of feathers at the end of it, that actually tells you about the wind speed. We're actually gonna talk about that in about a week. So we will actually talk more about it later in the class. But good question. Thank you for asking that. Thank you for asking that, Jordy. Um, so for right now, we're just gonna focus on this black line here, uh, the rightmost of the two black lines, this actually tells us the air temperature of the atmosphere. And it's because of this that we're able to determine if the atmosphere is stable or not. Because what we can actually do is we can compare the temperature of a parcel to the temperature of the atmosphere. Okay, great. So now I've given you the temperature of a parcel and I've given you the temperature of the atmosphere. What do we do with that? Well, here's what we actually do. What we then do is we ask ourselves one of three questions. Is the parcel warmer than the atmosphere, cooler than the atmosphere, or at the same temperature as the atmosphere? If the parcel is warmer than the atmosphere, it has what is called a buoyant force to it. It is a buoyant parcel, therefore it is able to rise. So if an air parcel is warmer than its environment, then it rises. On the other hand, if an air parcel is cooler than the environment, it sinks. Now, what about if a parcel of air is the same temperature as the environment? What if a parcel of air is the same temperature as the environment? What would happen to that parcel? All right, one person has private messaged me a really good answer. And now I see a publicly answered really good answer. So when a parcel is warmer than the surrounding atmosphere, it rises. When it's colder than the surrounding atmosphere, it sinks. When it's the same temperature as the surrounding atmosphere, it stays in place. So a parcel of air that is the same temperature as its surroundings stays in place. It stays put. It stays in place. So that being said, so, so this is how we determine if a parcel of air can rise or not. If the parcel is warmer than the surrounding atmosphere, it rises. If it's cooler, it sinks. Now that being said, the stability of the atmosphere is determined by comparing the temperature to the temperature of the parcel to the temperature of the environment the temperature of the surrounding atmosphere. If a part, and it all starts with this. If we start with a parcel of air at the surface and we push it up, if the atmosphere is unstable, the parcel will just keep rising. Just like how when you kick the ball off the top of the hill, 
it kept moving further away from the top of the hill. Well, here, if you push, push a parcel off the ground, it just keeps rising. On the other hand, if the parcel of air or if the atmosphere is, uh, or the atmosphere is stable instead of it being unstable, if it, if it is stable, it sinks. In this case, if I throw the parcel up, it just comes right back down. It just sinks right back down. So this is stability in the atmosphere. This is how stability in the atmosphere works. If the atmosphere is stable, I push the parcel up, it sinks right back down. If it's unstable, I push the parcel up, it keeps rising. Now that being said, we need to then be able to know what the temperature of the parcel is and what the temperature of the atmosphere is. So the parcel's temperature, you can calculate it. If you know what the temperature of a parcel at the surface is, as it rises, you can calculate its rate of cooling. If the parcel is unsaturated, it cools by 10 degrees. If it is saturated, it cools by six. On the other hand, for the atmosphere, you have to directly observe it. You have to launch a weather balloon. And what comes out the other end of that weather balloon is data. Now, what I will do is rather than giving you some weird jagged looking plot, I'll just tell you, hey, we launched the weather balloon and it said that the temperature cools this much with height. I will just give you a set atmospheric lapse rate. And then what you're gonna be doing is for every thousand meters, you're gonna compare the temperature of the parcel to the temperature of the atmosphere. If the parcel's warmer, it keeps rising. If the parcel's cooler, it sinks. Why does this matter? Because when air is really unstable, you can actually see pretty crazy things happen in a short amount of time. You don't get the balloon back. Somebody just asked me, how do you get that balloon back? You don't. Um, that's a story for another time, but um, yeah, no, there are all kinds of stories of, of the instrument pack from a weather balloon falling in somebody's yard, and you usually don't get those back. Um, usually people hold on to them for conversation pieces and stuff. Okay. So how many of you have ever experienced a day, usually not here in California, where you've gone outside in the morning, it was nice and clear. And then a couple of hours later, it started pouring, lightning, thunder. It was nice and clear, and then it started, the weather got really bad. Have any of you ever experienced that before? None of you have ever been to Colorado? Anywhere east of the Rocky Mountains? Okay, one person. Got one person who says that they've experienced that. So believe it or not, especially during the summertime, in an unstable atmosphere, which is very common east of the Rocky Mountains, instability is actually very common. What you will actually get is you'll get a situation where It'll be perfectly clear in the morning. You get up, it is a beautiful, gorgeous, glorious morning. And then around 10 a.m., you start noticing puffy clouds starting to form. By 11, they're really starting to build upwards. By 12, they're full-blown cumulonimbus clouds. By 1, you've got a thunderstorm overhead. You can go from clear to crazy thunderstorms like that. And it's because of the stability of the atmosphere. And then also, when air is really stable, that's when you get really bad air quality because air just stays trapped near the surface of the earth. So I'm going to do an example in a few minutes because I feel like that will really help with this. So. There are three types of stabilities. There's what's called absolute stability, 
conditional instability and absolute instability. Here's how they work. They're actually based on those two magical lapse rates for a parcel of air. So we know a parcel of air, cools, a parcel of air cools. So a parcel of air cools 10 degrees for every 1,000 meters if dry and 6 degrees for every 1,000 meters if wet, if saturated. Well, the stability of the atmosphere actually is related to these different parcel rates of cooling. And here's how they work. So I don't know why this slide ended up on here. That was totally my fault. That's OK. I'll fill it in here and make sure that I post the correct slide later. In a stable atmosphere, the atmosphere actually cools slower than a dry parcel. In this case, the lapse rate is less than six degrees Celsius per every 1,000 meters. In this case, no parcels of air can rise. The reason why is because in a stable atmosphere, Regardless of if a parcel is moist or dry, it can't rise. The atmosphere is cooling too slowly. And so very, very quickly as a parcel of air rises, it cools faster than the surrounding atmosphere. So it can't rise. It ends up sinking. So in a stable atmosphere, no parcels can rise. In a conditionally unstable atmosphere, our lapse rate is between, so the lapse rate of the atmosphere is between six degrees Celsius per every 1,000 meters and 10 degrees Celsius per every 1,000 meters. In this case, in this case, the atmosphere cools quicker than a moist parcel. So moist parcels can rise. However, they cool slower, the atmosphere cools slower than a dry parcel. So dry parcels can't rise. In this case, in a conditionally unstable atmosphere, only saturated parcels can rise. And then finally, in an absolutely unstable atmosphere, the lapse rate is greater than 10 degrees Celsius per every 1,000 meters. In this case, the lapse rate of the atmosphere is greater than 10 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. What this means is that the atmosphere is cooling faster than the parcel will. So very quickly, the parcel becomes warmer than the surrounding atmosphere, and it just keeps rising and rising and rising. And it just keeps going up, 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 and up. It just keeps rising. In this case, all parcels can rise. So in a stable atmosphere, no parcels can rise. In a conditionally unstable atmosphere, only moist parcels can rise. And in an absolutely unstable atmosphere, all parcels can rise. Let me show you what I mean. Let's actually do a few examples of this. Whoops, let me go back to that. Let me actually do a few examples of this. I think rather than going like super describing each of these, I think it would be easier to do an example. So let's do it. 
Okay, let me open up a whiteboard, a dry erase board right here. Okay. Let's say we have a dry parcel of air. and a moist parcel of air. So we have a dry parcel of air and a moist parcel of air. Let's assume that each of them at the surface of the earth has a temperature of, let's say 30 degrees Celsius. Each one of them has a, has a surface temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. Okay, really quickly, what will my dry parcels temperature be at 1,000 meters? Twenty. What will my moist parcels temperature be at a thousand meters? Twenty-four. Okay. Now let's go to two thousand meters. What would my dry parcel be at two thousand meters? Ten degrees Celsius. And what about my moist parcel? 18 degrees Celsius. Okay, one more. What about at 3,000 meters? Well, what would my dry parcels temperature be? It would be zero. And you all know what I'm about to ask next. <laughs> yes, I love it. Okay, so that is what would happen if a dry parcel rose, what would happen if a moist parcel rose. Now, let's actually launch a weather balloon. So here I am, got a weather balloon. And let's suppose I launch it into the atmosphere. And what it gives me is it gives me an atmosphere with a lapse rate of 12 degrees Celsius per every 1,000 meters and a surface temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. So now we're looking at the atmosphere. So we figure out the atmosphere's lapse rate by launching a weather balloon. Okay. So that being said, what would the atmosphere's temperature be at 1,000 meters? 20. If its lapse rate is 12 per every 1,000 meters, at 1,000 meters, its temperature would be 18. What about at 2,000 meters? Its temperature would be 6. What about at 3,000 meters? Negative six. Okay, so now let's assume that even though everything was at equilibrium at the surface, both the dry parcel and the moist parcel have the same temperature as the atmosphere at the surface. Let me actually change my color to indicate this. So at the surface, the parcel and the environment are equal to each other. But let's say something allows the parcel to rise. Let's say I decide I want to kill everybody with like a huge thunderstorm. I'm Dr. Evil with my liquid hot magma and I want to kill everybody with an evil thunderstorm. And I push the parcel up to a thousand meters. Which one will be warmer, the dry parcel or the atmosphere? 
at a thousand meters? Which one will be warmer? The dry parcel or the atmosphere? The dry parcel, right? The dry parcel has a temperature of 20, whereas the atmosphere has a temperature of 18. So the dry parcel is warmer. So what, what is it going to do? What is my dry parcel going to do? It's going to rise. Yeah. My dry parcel is going to rise. Bingo. On the other hand, and the reason why is because my dry parcel is warmer than the atmosphere. Now, what about my moist parcel? Is my, my moist parcel warmer or cooler than the atmosphere? It's warmer as well. So it also rises. So my moist parcel also rises. Okay, what about at 2,000 meters? What would happen to my dry parcel? Would it still rise at 2,000 meters? Yeah, my dry parcel has a temperature of 10, the atmosphere has a temperature of six. Okay, what about my moist parcel? What is it going to do? It's also going to rise. And then what about at 3,000 meters? Let me make that negative sign a little more clear there. What is my dry parcel gonna do at 3,000 meters? Still rises. What about my moist parcel? Still rises. This is an example of an absolutely unstable atmosphere. In this case, the atmosphere is cooling at a rate quicker than both a dry parcel and a moist parcel. So in this case, either one of those two parcels is going to just keep rising. It's going to continue to rise at its own free will. It's just going to keep going up, 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 and up. It's just going to keep going up. Okay. Now let's say the next day, the temperature outside is still 30. The temperature outside is still 30. I go outside, I launch my weather balloon. But now, instead of getting a, a rate of cooling of 12 per every thousand meters, let's say instead I get a rate of cooling of four per every thousand meters. So at the surface, my atmosphere has a temperature of 30 degrees Celsius and a rate of cooling of four per every thousand meters. What would my atmosphere's temperature be at a thousand meters? 26. What about 2,000 meters? 22. And what about 3,000 meters? 18. Okay. So at 18. All right. So I still have the same dry and moist parcels from the previous day. But now the atmosphere's conditions have changed, which is why you keep launching weather balloons. Well, now. Just for the sake of simplicity, let me do that. Now, let's suppose I am once again Dr. Evil. And I am trying to take over the world by, just, by starting like a killer thunderstorm. And I take my parcel of air and I push it up to 1,000 meters. In this case, which one is warmer, the parcel or the atmosphere? Well, let's do it for dry first. Which one is warmer, the dry parcel or the atmosphere? 
In this case, the atmosphere is the warmer one. What is my dry parcel going to do in that case? It's going to sink. Now, okay, so it sinks. I go back down. I, I, I realize, okay, I'm not going to be able to do this with dry air. Let me try it with moist air. Which one is the warmer one comparing the atmosphere to a moist parcel? Which one is warmer? The atmosphere has a temperature of 26. The parcel has a temperature of 24. So what is my moist parcel going to do in this case? It's also going to sink. <clears throat> now, being the person that I am, I don't want to give up. I'm going to keep pushing up, 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 and up. What about at 2,000 meters? What would, what would my dry parcel do at 2,000 meters? What about my moist parcel? What would it do? It also sink. What about at 3,000 meters? Also sink. Same for the moist parcel. So in this case, the only thing I changed was the atmosphere's lapse rate. In this case, everything sinks. This is a stable atmosphere. In this case, if I push the parcel up, it sinks right back down. So in the first case, when the atmosphere was at a rate of 12, it was both parcels were able to rise. In this case, both parcels couldn't rise. Both parcels sank. All right, one more. We're almost done. One more. All right. So I'm disappointed. I'm Dr. Evil. I can't get my, my thunderstorm to start on this day. My evil thunderstorm isn't going to work. I get up the next morning. I go out and I launch my weather balloon. And I get an atmosphere with a surface temperature of 30, just like with my two parcels, but a lapse rate of eight. Oh, let me switch that over to Nya. But instead of a lapse rate of four, I now have a lapse rate of eight. What will my parcel's temperature, or sorry, my par oh my gosh. What will, my, what will the atmosphere's temperature be at 1,000? 22. What about 2,000? 14. What about 3,000? Six. Okay. So, I get my dry parcel, I put it in my helicopter, I go up to 1,000, I push it out. What's gonna happen to my dry parcel in this environment? In this environment, my dry parcel is going to sink. My dry parcel has a temperature of 20, while the atmosphere has a temperature of 22. Jordy just got ahead of me. What about the moist parcel? In this case, the moist parcel is actually warmer than the atmosphere. In this case, the moist parcel will rise. In this case, the moist parcel will rise. And in fact, if you keep going up, it'll keep rising. Meanwhile, if you look at our dry parcel, our dry parcel is just gonna keep dropping, dropping, dropping. It, like I can't get that dry parcel hot high enough to rise on its own. It's just not gonna happen. But for my moist parcel, I was able to get it to rise. So all of this said, an atmosphere's lapse rate determines everything about stability, whether a parcel is able to rise or not. 
and I will actually type this down nya. All right. So if the atmosphere cools at a rate of, let me stretchy this. If the atmosphere cools at a rate of less than six degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters, meaning the atmosphere is cooling slower than the dry rate, or sorry, slower than the moist rate, that is a stable atmosphere. If it cools between six per 1,000 and 10, oops, per 1,000, it is conditionally unstable. And the condition is, in this case, if you take a look, the moist parcel can rise. So if the air is moist, it's unstable. If the air is dry, it's not. It's just boring, stable, sinking kind of thing going on. And then if the atmosphere's lapse rate is greater than 10, this was the first example I gave, absolutely unstable. In this case, the atmosphere is absolutely unstable. So in the first example I gave, I used a lapse rate of 12. In that case, both parcels were warmer than the atmosphere, and so both parcels were able to rise. That's an absolutely unstable atmosphere. In the second example, I gave a lapse rate of four per every thousand meters. So let's see here. So yeah, it would be absolutely stable. You can, you can call it that. Usually we just say just stable, but yeah, it's absolutely stable. So in that case, neither parcel can rise. So in this case, neither parcel can rise. In the case of a conditionally unstable atmosphere, only moist parcels can rise. And in, a, in an absolutely unstable atmosphere, all parcels can rise. So that's really the big difference between these three types of stability. That's really the big difference. Now what I'm actually going to do next time, next time what I'm actually going to do is I'm actually going to tell you what actually allows air to rise. So up to this point, I've said, so let's take a parcel of air and let's push it up. And if the atmosphere is stable, it'll sink back down. If it's unstable, it'll rise. But what actually pushes air up? Well, we're going to talk about that next time, and we're also going to do a few more examples of this next time, tying it all together. So if you still feel foggy about it today, that is totally fine. Um, one of the things I did do is on Canvas, I actually posted a cheat sheet, as I like to call it. Normally, I let people print it out and bring it with them to the next, to the next quiz or the next whatever, our next midterm or our midterm when it comes up next week next Thursday, which I'm actually gonna get a study guide up for it by this Thursday, and we'll actually have a review session. Um, I'll talk more about that on Thursday, but um, because this is all being done at home, you can use whatever you want. But that cheat sheet actually takes all this information and collects it into one place. Um, so I would recommend between now and Thursday, taking a look at that cheat sheet, reviewing the material on it, and seeing if something, if you have any questions about it. And then on Thursday, we will actually do a few more examples, and then I'll tell you what actually pushes air up. And that'll be it for stability. And by the way, once again, this is the hardest part of the course. You get through this, you're in great shape.
All right. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, I can hang out for a few minutes. Otherwise, it should actually be a beautiful day today. Um, the air quality is still kind of meh. Um, but that being said, have a great day, everybody. And I will see you all on Thursday. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Yes, I'm actually going to get that up right now. Bye, everybody. All right, I still see two people in the room. Uh, do either one of you have a question I can help out with? Yep, oh, and just like that, one person get, oh, left. Well, if not, um, I will um, sign off right now. I'm gonna get that review sheet up and then I will see you all on Thursday.